Hello. This is season two of the Idea to Start a Podcast, where we identify and break down strategies that will help early stage entrepreneurs give their startup ideas a fighting chance. Idea to Startup is brought to you by Tacklebox, an accelerator program for idea stage entrepreneurs with full time jobs. Tacklebox runs cohorts in person in New York City as well as virtually. Check out gettacklebox.com to apply. This week, we had an awesome conversation with Mark Merrill, co founder of Riot Games. Riot makes a video game you've definitely heard of, League of Legends. The stats on League of Legends are ridiculous. They recently hit $20 billion in revenue. At any given point each day, there are about 8 million people playing the game simultaneously. And probably most interesting to me, high school kids can now get scholarships to play League of Legends in college just like any other sport. Mark and I talked through what's most relevant to you, the early days. How did he get a complex video game built when he wasn't a game developer? How did he know the idea was viable? How did he navigate network effects and get the first players excited? How was he able to raise money when he didn't have a game live and didn't have any proof that people would like it? This was an awesome conversation. As always, if you've got thoughts or questions, shoot me an email at brian at gettacklebox.com, and I hope you enjoy. Mark, welcome. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, so I was looking for uh, my favorite stat about League of Legends to start, and it was tough because there are so many that are, are amazing. So I picked two. Uh, as of August 2018, there were 111 million active players, which is wild to me. And uh, second, you can get a college scholarship to play League of Legends all sorts of places, including the Big Ten. Mm -hmm. um, so you have essentially created a new sport, uh, mm -hmm. which is blows my mind as well. So we've got a lot to talk about. I'm excited to get into it. So anyone who doesn't know, maybe explain Riot Games League of Legends. Sure. So uh, Riot Games was founded in 2006 by myself and uh, my business partner, a guy named Brandon Beck. Uh, we were college buddies at uh, University of Southern California, USC. And um, you know we were two friends who really bonded over uh, games in particular. And we were both uh, sort of business guys by background. He was a business major at USC and went into strategy consulting at Bain. Um, you know, upon graduation, I was first in finance and then in business, business marketing. Uh, but after college, we lived together, had this small West Hollywood apartment. We had these two back-to-back -back gaming rigs. And anytime we were home, the thing that we always couldn't help ourselves but do was play games together, talk about opportunities in games, express frustration or excitement about, you know, future trends. And that dynamic ultimately, you know, led to the, the sort of creation of, of Riot. Um, and, you know, Brandon was an individual, and I think for any entrepreneur, you know, figuring out if you're going to be a solo founder or partnering with individuals is an incredibly important thing. And I've been just very, very blessed to have a business partner that I trust and that really complimented me incredibly well. Um, you know, back at, uh, at USC, the first business plan we ever actually worked on was, uh, you know, we were going to call, we're going to create a sort of a third party tournament organizer for online games. We're going to call it the UGL or ultimate gaming league. Cause we always believed that games could be sports and had a lot of the same dynamics because we, love to compete at the highest levels and love to watch other people compete in teams and, you know, felt a fan affinity for, you know, some of these early pros and things like that. And we wanted to help build the ecosystem. That business ended up not really going anywhere. We're still in school and, and too busy to really go make it happen, or at least that's what we told ourselves. Uh, but yeah, it's been fun uh, to nonetheless, you know, through League of Legends and through Riot, be able to help contribute to, uh, to the growth of esports. Um, because, you know, it's, in some ways, we just think it's great to be able to create a platform for so many people to help live their dream. Um, or often, you know, and, and Brandon and I both experience this too, and I think many gamers around the world have, you know, people have faced a lot of stigma for their passion, right? You know, whether it's parents or school administrators or teachers or people in media or friends or whatnot, always been like, hey, why, why are you wasting your time, you know, pouring your heart and soul into this, this thing that I don't really understand? And, um, attitudes are starting to change and have been changing over time, partially to your point, because there's more external validation where now there's a viable career path, you know, um, to be a journalist or to be a pro or to be a coach or uh, to be, you know, a social media influencer and things like that. And so anyway, it's just, it's been a true privilege to be able to, to help do our part to enable others to uh, have great careers. Amazing. Yeah. It's created a whole infrastructure for people. So what I think is really interesting to our uh, listeners, a lot of them are early stage entrepreneurs just getting going. 
this obviously has turned into a, a massive product, but it had to start as something very simple and core, maybe. Um, so thinking back to those early days when you guys are back-to-back -back playing games and then discussing what could be, yep. what was sort of that initial spark that was like, there is something here that we need to follow? Yeah. Yeah, so I think part of the core insight was that we as players felt underserved by a lot of the offerings that the incumbent publishers at the time were delivering, where we were the type of gamers who we would go play lots of games and bought lots of games and whatnot, but there were very few games that we would want to go incredibly deep on and, and play for thousands of hours or hundreds of hours. And we thought many other gamers wanted to do that too. The only games at the time that really operated in a direct-to-consumer way that was sort of evolving the products and experiences you know, with this direct relationship with players was MMOs, massive multiplayer online games, such as EverQuest and then subsequently World of Warcraft, and uh, but many online games such as StarCraft or Counter Strike or you know there were a variety of games that we were playing that we were uh, very into Warcraft Three, etc. The development team had an incentive structure in the publishers where they needed to go like most of the most of the games were sold for sixty dollars at retail, and so we thought that the game industry was going to be undergoing a similar transformation from packaged goods to software as a service that you know you're seeing we're starting to see at the time again this is 2004 2005 2006 where there was sort of itunes versus tower records and blockbuster versus netflix whatnot we thought the game industry was going to be evolving in a similar way you know so as players right we would get frustrated when again a great company that makes great content such as activision would create guitar hero and then it'd be guitar hero 2 and then guitar hero 3 and then guitar hero metallica guitar hero aerosmith it's like all i want to do is play guitar hero and share songs and things like that like why do i have to go spend 60 dollars for, you know, next year for an incrementally better version or different version of that same game I'm already playing, make it a service, right? And so there was a lot of pain in the, the different online experiences that would happen as a result of the business model misalignment. And many developers didn't want to move on. They wanted to continue to support games. And that's what we want. It's like, don't work on StarCraft 2, help build StarCraft because we love it. And so League of Legends was sort of birthed from that understanding because we were also playing a game called Dota, uh, which is a mod of Warcraft 3, Defense of the Ancients. And I played thousands of games of Dota, loved it. And this was a, a game that was essentially was a, again, a mod of an existing product, which means imagine that, you know, a publisher created a game like chess and then players decided to change the rules of chess to make it checkers. That's essentially what a mod is, where mm -hmm. people use existing assets to create a new game or a new gameplay model. And that had a, a website that was created for it. And this whole community started to evolve around it. And it was 100% free, 100% community driven, and to us helped to validate that games as a service across all these other genres was and should be a thing. And so we ended up partnering with some of the creators of Dota and saying, hey, let's go build sort of a next evolution, right? Taking a lot of the, the lessons learned and a lot of the great things to, to elevate the experience decoupled from this map editor where we can build our own backend infrastructure and do all these things necessary to help, you know, make this truly great. And, uh, and that's what League of Legends is, essentially this evolution of uh, the genre, which is now known as MOBAs or multiplayer on a battle arenas. Uh, and for us, we always viewed that, again, as sort of the proof point for the broader company thesis around very high quality core games, you know, direct to consumer, you know, all around the world. And um, so we sort of unapologetically, you know, try to cater to the gamers that have the highest expectations, that are most engaged, that want to spend thousands of hours, that have this deep passion which also means that they're going to be highly critical. You know, their their needs and expectations always go up. And, uh, you know, but to us, like, that is the audience that we can deeply relate to and that Riot as a company has been built to try to serve. Riot now is, you know, over 2,500 people across the world in, in 23 offices and to support that that success of League of Legends. And, yeah, we just announced uh, at our 10-year anniversary a couple weeks ago, a 10-year anniversary for League of Legends, a whole slate of new games and uh, an animated series that we're really excited about as well. So, uh, you know, we think the future is hopefully pretty bright. Cool. Yeah, amazing. And it's all it's all kind of from that initial insight, which which I'd love to like push on a little bit. So, yeah. it sounds like there was certainly some business model innovation there, where you're saying like, I've seen SaaS work other places. SaaS is going to work here. Yeah. Um, which is fascinating. It's like the, the middle of this Venn diagram between we understand the business model innovation going on. We are gamers so we understand what gamers truly want and then you had a clear idea of who your customer was too it was like we don't want casual gamers we want people who this is uh, sort of the way they identify themselves right so you looked at the center of that venn diagram and 
said there's validation for each of these somewhere. Mm -hmm. This is worth our time to build. Is that is that fair? Yeah, that is a better way of saying it than I did. Thank <laughs> you. You know, and so I will I will say that um, the the nine months where, where Brandon and I were working at our respective careers, sort of putting together the business plan for Riot, it started to kind of as this iterative thing where we're like, there's kind of a good idea here, right? Like, why isn't Dota its own product and game? And that like that led us to looking at the industry dynamics you were talking about, and then you know recognizing, of course, the incentives of a lot of publishers they're not going to go after these types of things, and so. So then, you know, we, we had to ask ourselves, well, could we go build the company that could build this great product and experience that if we did that, people would actually want it. And so we had to do sort of nine months of diligence, literally trying to talk ourselves out of it. Hmm. And uh, because we you know, wanted, you know, needed to ask ourselves, do we want to take the career risk and sort of jump off of our you know, existing tracks to go make this happen? We were 24 and 25, had no professional software development experience. Neither of us had any substantial assets, you know, to do this. I moved in with my, you know, now wife, then girlfriend in her one bedroom apartment with no TV, <laughs> you know, uh, as we sort of poured everything into this company. And um, in a lot of ways, we sort of had, had no business succeeding because we didn't know how hard it would be and what we were getting into. But to your point, we could deeply relate to what we thought the future for the audience we we're trying to serve needed to look like. And then we just kind of relentlessly worked backwards from that belief and vision and understanding to try to cultivate the expertise and put together the pieces capable of delivering on that vision. That's something else that kind of jumps out at me, a few things that I want to definitely touch on. You knew what great would look like, and you knew that you know, it was going to take a while to get there. But, right. but understanding what great looks like, I think, is something that a lot of founders uh, miss on early on. So I'll sort of like when someone gives me an, a startup idea, I'll say like, what does an amazing outcome look like for this initial set of customers? One, who are those customers? Mm -hmm. And two, what, what can you tell them in one sentence that will right. get them so excited? Right. And it sounds like you had that. Yep. And two fascinating things to me, none of this sounds like it was predicated on storylines or characters or like anything that was was like I would call a feature of the game. Right. It was all the architecture around it mm -hmm. and aligning the incentives for everyone first and then like filling in what would work for that. Is that fair? That is fair. So, it, however, I will say that uh, part of that was because we recognized after our initial conversations with publishers where originally Brandon and I just wanted to build a development company. And we're like, we just want to build games hmm. that are super focused on having no single player you know, our, our multiplayer in going deep around building this great competitive multiplayer framework. But then we talked to publishers who typically are, have the business model where they fund development uh, and developers to go build these types of games. And then they publish it or bring it to market. When we talked to publishers, they looked at us like we were crazy. <laughs> They're like, why would you have no single player? 80% of all game hours played are on single player. Most people don't even play multiplayer. Secondly, what are you talking about free to play? You're talking about having a competitive game targeting the most enthusiastic, high expectation gamers, and you want to have the game be free, and you want to, and like one VC put it succinctly, once we actually realized that we couldn't raise money from publishers because if we gave them the keys to the kingdom, we couldn't deliver the type of experiences that we needed to, we then realized we needed to raise venture money. So then we talked to 50 VCs, most told us, you know, 49 of them told us no. And, uh, you know, one put it pretty succinctly, it was like, so you want to have a bunch of 19-year-old boys, men, et cetera, killing each other in online games, and then meanwhile, you're going to make money by them playing dress-up doll. Well, it is. <laughs> and we're like, well, kind of, but not really. And they're like, yeah, good luck with that. You know? <laughs> and so, you know, and this is also pre-iPhone, pre-cloud, you know, the, the, the middleware market for technology and for online services was much less robust compared to it is now. And so anyway, there were a lot of barriers for us to even go raise the money um, necessary. But, you know, and to your point around, we knew what good looked like, we kind of did from a player experience standpoint because we were players, mm -hmm. but everybody was criticizing us. The mm -hmm. industry was criticizing it, you know, from a publishing standpoint. Most developers were like, mm, didn't want to join the company because we were two no names that had no track record. So why would they leave their great jobs and respective careers to come on this risky thing? You know, and oftentimes our family or friends or various other people would also be like, wait, you're going to go waste your whole Saturday and Sunday and nights or whatever, like go into this buddy's house, work on this business plan. Like we've got stuff to do. <laughs> And, um, and all of that is, it's just stuff that does accumulate on your psyche of course. and it's passive resistance that is, that makes you question your own conviction. And I think that's one of the hardest things as an entrepreneur is when am I delusional, right? Mm. And when am I actually sort of prescient in identifying this opportunity? And I think we've ebbed and flowed in that. And I think one of the things that, again, a partner can be really great at is 
when one of you are, are sort of down or having doubts, the other can step in and help, you know, with their sort of complementary skill set or perspective and be like, hey, no, we can do this. Here's why, here's how. Or, and anyway, you know, we very much have gone through ups and downs all throughout the years, uh, questioning ourselves, whether the ideas made sense. And again, a lot of it was about surrounding ourselves with the right people and, and trying to stick to that original North, North Star and iterating it as we learn more and, and evolving. Yeah, I, I was making notes as you were talking earlier about how did you have the uh, the fortitude to continue as everybody in the industry is telling you that this is wrong. And I think that it's like you always hear you, if you read, you know, a medium post, that's always going to be the thing. Like when everybody's telling you you're wrong, that's that's something interesting because whatever phrase gets used, the highways are packed, the back roads are empty, whatever. Right. Um, I, but, like, I like that. Actually. <laughs> I've used a similar metaphor, not even knowing that quote, talking about I described it as like we, we ended up running a race. Everyone else were like great athletes that were sprinting and looked awesome. They had their uniforms, could make these great games. We were in a wheelchair, stumbling <laughs> along, you know, like on this other track that nobody even looked at. But by the time everybody kind of looked over and was like, hey, that thing that they're doing is pretty cool. We were already on mile 12 sure. and we had started to pick up steam and start to move faster and whatnot. And so, um, yeah, I, I like that. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I, I, I don't know if I read it somewhere. Um, maybe I made it up. I Probably not. Um, but I, I think that that's to have that, to figure out how to have the belief in yourself mm -hmm. there. It takes like industry experience. It takes, as you mentioned, a good partner to say right. when things get down. I, people don't talk about the mental side of um, sort of the isolation of yeah. a startup early on and sort of searching for that one venture capitalist who believed and now is probably very happy that they did. Right. Cool. So that's sort of how things started. Um, one last point before we move forward on that. Neither of you were developers. Neither of you could build the game itself. Right. Um, that is sounds very similar to a situation where I get founders all the time who are like, I have an idea. I'm not a developer. I don't know how to build the thing. Right. How did you sort of rectify that in your mind? Were you like, we need to raise money and hire this person? Were you looking for them to join as a, as a co-founder? What, what was that like? Yes. So, and this is a pretty interesting thing where uh, we originally started the company and our first employee was that we put on the slides be like, this is the expert who knows how to build the game, right? If, if, if Brandon is sort of the finance strategy guy and I'm sort of the marketing and high level product guy, this is the person who, again, has, could be a CTO and executive producer and has all this experience. We found this individual through a recruiter because some of the people that we had, had met over time in the games industry, again, everybody would tell us no, uh, that they didn't want to go embark on this venture with us. And to make a long story short, we ended up having to uh, you know, part ways with this individual very early on. And the, I will summarize the situation without getting into details to essentially say that, you know, I, I think that we had very different visions for the direction the company should go. Like we, Brandon and I had raised money to go do what we were trying to do. Uh, and this person, I think, didn't actually believe in what we're trying to do. And so the challenge, of course, was the people that we would hire oftentimes ended up being these young, passionate, inexperienced, but culturally aligned people who also understood the content vision. Whereas the, a lot of the early developers that were brought in by this individual um, had previous experience in, in games and you know could uh, sort of some discipline expertise, but again, didn't buy into the vision. And there was this massive tension and conflict early on once we realized that what was actually happening on a daily basis was misaligned with the company needed to be, you know, we ended up taking over all of sort of development ourselves. And I think it was a critical inflection point where we're like, if we don't go learn everything about everything, this is going to fail and not work. Um, and so I do fundamentally believe that necessity is mother of all invention. And if we didn't have that early experience, we ended up would have failing down the road. And so we're sort of grateful for a lot of that sort of painful lessons, even though it's incredibly scary at the time because we're like, hey, board. Uh, of, you know, seed investors that gave us money to go do this thing. The guy that we told you that <laughs> is supposed to be the expert that knows how to do this, we just have to terminate and did. Um, and so, uh, you know, there were a million different reasons that, that Riot shouldn't have worked. Um, and so part of my advice to developers is, or to people that have, uh, or entrepreneurs that are in that similar situation is, finding out also what good looks like across the competencies that are necessary for you to be successful is incredibly important. So all of Riot's biggest inflection points in their first you know, probably eight years of the company were related to people, bringing in the right individuals, the right leaders who were aligned with the vision, the opportunity, and who had deep subject matter expertise around critical areas of competency, whether it's production or technology development or art or design. And so a lot of our big focus early on was how do we go learn what good looks like across these elements that we've identified are necessary for us to go be successful? And then how do we go get those people? And again, most of our top people told us no. 
and so we had to be relentless in finding ways to how do we get them involved anyway so like we created an advisory board we give free shares to great developers who we respected who we thought would have great expertise and could help us um, to just come in once every couple months and give advice to our young passionate individuals that didn't have a lot of experience and um, as those professionals had their situation changed because their careers or companies you know started to encounter some challenges and as we continue to gain momentum the equation then changed we're like wow i like these people they're actually overcoming a lot of problems they're making progress like this is kind of cool maybe i should take the risk and do a jump in and help and so i think cultivating relationships with people even if they're not going to join you now that maybe they'll join you later and or trying to get some of the expertise that people are often willing to share is really really important as well but don't allow yourself to get snowballed um, where you're like okay there's too much deep expertise or i can't understand it because i don't have a science background or an engineering background that's not true and anybody that tries to tell you, hey, trust me, I've got 20 years experience and this is the way it is, but can't explain what it is or why, don't believe them, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, well, okay, well, in your you know, incredible wisdom of your 20 years experience, what are the lessons learned in terms of why do we have to do something in this particular way? What's actually going on? And, um, you know, so we learned to ask lots of questions and dive in and, and get tied to the details. And again, we never became engineers, didn't, you know, write any of the code that ended up shipping with Legends, but we were still involved in all of the aspects of bringing the game and the product and the company together that could deliver what we were trying to do. So it sounds like you were incredibly stubborn and would not compromise on this North Star of what everyone had to be aligned in building. And then you sort of taught yourself through networking, through other other ways, like what are the different disciplines that need to get us there and what does great look like for each of those disciplines. And then again, you didn't compromise on those disciplines on who you hired right. or who was advising them. Right. One of the biggest problems that I'll see with our with early stage founders is they say, I need to build this product and I need a developer or a designer. And this person has agreed to work with me, so I'm working with them. And it's sort of like they don't I, I think people don't understand the opportunity cost of hiring the wrong person. Right. And it sounds like you guys nailed that. Well, we learned it early on, yeah. unfortunately. Uh when and again, experience is a really great teacher. Um and you know, but we con we've continued to learn that over time because as the company has scaled, that's another really interesting challenge is as companies do grow quickly, how do you continue to get the right people? What does the right look like, especially as you continue to evolve and the needs change? That's a whole another topic. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> I'd imagine. Um, so the one last one last thing I want to talk about on this before we move into the, the actual first version of the game is I saw one interview where you described, I don't know if you think about it as an Eisenhower box, but you described the Eisenhower box. You've got the four box yep. matrix of like urgent, not urgent, important, not important, mm -hmm. and sort of staying in, in the important boxes. Mm -hmm. I think about the network stuff early on and continuing to think through hiring as mm -hmm. potentially important, but not necessarily urgent. Yep. So how did you stay disciplined early on making sure that you did that stuff, this like very forward looking stuff? So yeah, early on, I think a lot of it was driven by intuition. We didn't have very formal processes, but I think we had this deep belief, again, that was kind of anchored by the ultimate experience we were trying to deliver, that we need to simultaneously make progress on the long-term solutions and vision that needs to exist while also delivering in the short term. And you need to do both constantly, and that's just really hard. <laughs> and there's this crazy tension between doing both of those across all the dimensions necessary that entrepreneurs need to figure out. But I do think that that framework, and there's a variety of different frameworks that I think can be incredibly useful at helping entrepreneurs focus on the things that matter and not, and, and, you know, not focus on the things that don't matter. Because a lot of times things that are urgent and not important can feel like they need to be addressed because, or anything in the urgent category, right? It feels like it needs to be addressed. Urgent, urgent and important, of course, does to a, cer to a certain extent. But if you're exclusively focusing on the short term, Eventually, in our experience, you end up building a bridge to nowhere or you end up making big mistakes that are incredibly costly from an opportunity cost standpoint. We had a mistake like that as an example. As we raised venture capital and were trying to build our own publishing business, we again wanted to mitigate risk and only develop the things that we needed to develop. So we have we were building more competency around building game engines and front end and a lot of the game services, pipelines, et cetera. The back end technology we wanted to buy because that's a whole different company building enterprise software writing a bunch of services to go be you know deployed onto hardware and again this is pre-cloud uh, you know where we had to then go run our own infrastructure lots of cost and expertise that was necessary for the company but uh, not 
from our initial analysis, not core to what really mattered. And so we ended up working with a third party who was a venture funded company that, uh, you know, a bunch of people from Stanford, great pedigree that also had some market validation where they were building a backend platform for a very respected developer uh, who also had great technical expertise. So we're like, okay, if, if this company would use these guys to go build their backend, clearly they're competent people. So we can do that too. Fast forward a year, we had to unwind the deal, tell our board, Hey, you know, that million plus dollars we spent and um, all this time on building this enterprise software platform. Yeah, it's actually not going to work. We had to start over from scratch. Oof. We fully expected the board to pull the plug on the company. And Brandon and I would have, you know, walked off in shame with our heads held down being like, this is our fault. We, we screwed it up. Um, fortunately, because we had, uh, so there, the board was made up of three individuals at this time. This is post raising our Series A capital. There was Mitch Lasky from Benchmark. There was Rick Heitzman from Firstmark. And uh, Jarl Mohn, uh, who was the founder of E, most recently CEO of NPR, was the, the, uh, the board member representing kind of the seed investors, et cetera. Everybody was very upset, but Mitch, who was the most experienced video game operator in the whole VC world, you know, he was the former head of the CEO of Jam that sold it to EA, which became EA Mobile. He ran Worldwide Studios Activision. Uh, to make a long story short, he had a lot of game development experience. And so he's like, you guys didn't have a catastrophic development mistake in your model. Of course, this is game development. This is <laughs> on the game development. This is part of the deal. Let's not, let's see how they react, right? And what the plan is and whatnot, rather than just say sayonara. And so we were incredibly grateful to have that opportunity, but we only had six months of cash. Our venture capital was also premised on the first, the Series A, the $7 million financing that was tranched. We needed to run a successful beta of a thousand concurrent players to get the second half of the money. So we now had six months to build a back end from scratch and run a beta. The game was also not good enough. It was delayed. It was behind schedule also. So um, again, necessity being the builder of all invention, we ended up building a team, um, an individual uh, who, you know, named Scott Gelb, who was our VP of engineering, now our, you know, then CTO and now our COO over time, uh, was the person that we thought was the, this, the person that we must get to come build this platform for lots of reasons. And, uh, when we finally got Scott to join the company, first thing he did is bring out some of his friends from St. Louis, uh, who were engineers and make a long story short, they put together this whole plan to then build a back end. Everybody sort of killed themselves for six months, putting together a team and a bare bones infrastructure. And we had three weeks of cash. We ended up running a beta in the Philippines where we hired 1,100 people to come in and play the game. We paid wow. them to play the game. We installed the game with C on CD-ROM at a bunch of LAN cafes because we didn't want to expose the game to Western audience because, again, we thought that it would taint people's perceptions because of the state of the game at the time. And so we hit our benchmark. The, you know, the board was thrilled, and uh, we got the rest of the capital to you know, live to fight another day. But we ended up having the highest burn rate of any of the companies in their portfolio pre-launch. And it is a really stressful thing when you're spending a fixed amount of other people's money. Sure. And, you know, one of the questions, uh, you know, is around like, well, how do you know you're making progress and what does validation look like when you're not actually getting real customer feedback? And so we tried to get momentum uh, in any way we possibly could. Uh, so we pre-sold distribution rights for China, for League of Legends and to Europe. Hmm. And so that's how we ended up partnering. So we got an advance on future royalties, which then helped fund some development. And again, it was sort of like we had to run full speed essentially at the cliff and assuming that the bridge would end up being there and find ways to ensure that the bridge in terms of capital ended up being there without slowing down. Mm. And that is a very scary thing to do. Uh, but we were able to just squeak in over and over and over and keep the board happy and, and have enough momentum and ultimately get the launch. And uh, Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Um, so that's, uh, there's a lot to dig on there, but <laughs> let's, um, let's jump into that first version of the product. So I think, so you launch in the Philippines, yep. you get some data points. I assume you sort of rework the game, get it to where you feel comfortable with it, launch it in the U.S.? Yeah, and in Europe simultaneously. And in Europe. Yeah, because Western Europe and the United States, there's a lot of overlap, a lot of the media, you know, sites, mm -hmm. whatnot. And so one of the things that was fascinating, though, is because we we're launching a free game, no media would give us any press <laughs> in the game business at first because there was such a stigma around free games because most of the free games were imported content that were like 10 years old from Asia. So launch for us ended up being sort of this arbitrary date where we had a box. We did a distribution deal for a skew of essentially digital content that we put into a box or essentially <laughs> it's a code. So then when Meet press would ask us like, is your game free? We'd say, we have a box. Yeah. It's a bit great. Now we can cover you. So PC gamer or, you know, uh, you know, various other publications, but that's not how you typically would want to launch an online service. You don't want to have it. You kind of just want to roll into beta and keep reacting with player feedback. But we had this hard go to market date because of these constraints 
that was somewhat self-imposed, but we thought it was necessary to go establish credibility around being a premium quality title that could meet the expectations of these enthusiast players. Anyway, so that relates to Europe because uh, Riot was going to publish and launch in North America ourselves. And then our partner, which is a subsidiary of France Telecom, was launching in Europe. We could write an amazing case study in terms of why quality of service matters because League of Legends in North America was growing. Um, but we were not Pokemon Go. This was not an instant success right out the gates. This was this. We were incrementally bigger the next month compared to the previous month. But in Europe, we weren't growing at all. And a lot of it, we think we can sort of isolate to that mindset around service, not responding to players. You know, the servers would go down on a Friday night. Servers would stay down for hours. Be like, hey, I'm, you know, we'll solve it in the morning. I think it's like, that doesn't make any sense to us. So fortunately, we were able to unwind the deal a couple months later and then built our own European publishing operation in 45 days, uh, which was another sort of hectic thing. But um, anyway, yeah, launch was a, a very scary time also. So, yeah, and, and it's it's really interesting because I imagine that this is the game benefits from network effects. So for sure, um, it's not like Mario where if you get someone, I'm going to play by myself, I'm going to enjoy it. Right. Um, Which is why the free model was so important. Also, yep. nobody would have spent sixty dollars to go buy a game from a bunch of no names, you know, that had no track record or whatnot. It's like, eh, I'll, I, I want to hear if the game's good first. But because it was free, people would be like, you know what, I'm willing to go try it. And once they tried it, they're like, this is actually pretty compelling. And this is pretty fun. And wow, these developers really are communicating a lot and they care about me and I see the game improving rapidly and there's all these content updates coming. And so I believe that this is going to get better over time. And so people would, because of that trust that was developed, that gave people the impetus to stick around and give us a shot. And then we continue to improve over time. And to your point around network effects, those early evangelists and adopters started to then bring in their friends and tell people like, hey, I know you may have preconceived notions of what this is, but let me tell you why you're going to love it. Come play with me. You know, but we didn't spend any money essentially on advertising. The game grew virally through word of mouth. And, and it was a tough barrier too, because the game is hard to learn how to play. It's a sport, right? So imagine trying to build a tutorial for American football. Like, here's what the line of scrimmage is, and here's how to play linebacker, or, you know, what all, you know, I mean, there's so many, so much complexity at the individual skill level and position versus the team compositions. And, and anyway, so oftentimes people have to go help others overcome these barriers to entry, but they would say that it's worth it once you get over the hump because the value is great if you're this type of enthusiast gamer that really wants to play deep competitive games for a long time. And I think that that can be some of the most powerful messaging early on where it's like, this is not for any, like the, this is only for a very specific type of person. If you're not this type of person, it's not for you. Right. Cause then you create experts and the experts are then excited to teach other people. Cause they say, Oh, if you are like me, then you'll like this. Right. Well, and we always assume that that niche of players like us was a, a lot smaller than it ended up being, uh, especially in a globalized world where if you create a great content or experience for some particular niche, Sure enough, when you expand that perspective to a global audience, that's a pretty, you know, oftentimes it can be a really big audience. And um, that was our experience. And so, you know, but we're, we're very grateful to, you know, our early adopters and players who believed in, in Riot and believed in League of Legends. And uh, many of which who then became content creators or early pro players or team owners and whatnot. And, and so as we've nurtured this ecosystem, it's also been really great to see so many of these people who helped, really helped build the game and the whole community to become what it is. Like it wasn't Riot alone, not at all. We gave it sort of this initial push, and then the community got behind it and really helped elevate it to, to what it is today. Incredible. Um, so when I think about products, I think about having to offer customers a very like very specific short term value, and then very and then clear long term value. Yep. So you mentioned that people that this was spreading through word of mouth, and they would say you have to play this. What I'm interested in is what did they say? Like what was that? You have to play this because what was the sound bite that? was so differentiated that got this game to grow. Yeah, I think it was really, um, it was really around the core gameplay, like that it's just really fun. And so uh, come play beyond my team. There weren't a lot of team-based multiplayer games at the time. And so where each player needed to rely on another player to perform a role in a great sort of co-op way, but then was also competitive. And League blended the two really, really well, where the challenge of playing against another team of players who are equally motivated and have the same tools you have that are trying to do, you know, trying to fulfill the objectives of the game is really fun. I mean, that's what sports are, right? Like what's the goal of soccer? You know, get 11 people on each side and put the ball in the net more times than the other team 
within 90 minutes. And then if you do, you win, right? The depth of engagement comes from all of the human interactions that occur. League of Legends is the same way. And so it essentially was this digital platform for people to engage in that with all these different tools where you could outplay people, you could outthink them. There are all these out of game strategies. And so people ran with this sandboxy platform and they're like, let's go, let's go win. Let's go do awesome things. Let's go engage it. Cause it's super fun. And I want you with me. And so then they'd bring in their friends. That sounds like incredibly compelling messaging to me, like join my team. Yeah. And then it creates the dynamic of if I'm creating a team from scratch and something that's free that I see value in playing for, for a long time, I want to find my friend who is the best gamer. So, so you're sort of like the flywheel starts where it's like you are, you have people out in the field playing this giant game of telephone with like join my team for the best people that would be customers for you. Right. And in our case, so there are other games that, of course, did that too, right? I mean, Counter-Strike, Dota, you know, at the time there was a, a competitor that was launching from a, game, a company called S2 that was here as a New Earth. There, you know, so there were a variety of other games and companies that, of course, created great multiplayer experiences. This, this is sort of a difficult thing to talk about in terms of what really differentiated Riot, but I think it's, there's also this confluence of factors where the whole is greater than some of its parts, where the, the characters were really interesting. So the champions that you could play had these cool backstories. The, the way that they played in game felt really good. The design elements of the, the item system and the flow and pacing of the game had the right pacing. The content cadence in terms of how we'd update the game was rapid and far faster than any other company previously. The relationship and direct to consumer, you know, direct to player communication and feedback loop with the developer was more intimate and authentic, I think, than and frequent where we, we allowed every rioter and still do, despite the scale of the company, to talk directly to our players. No other company does that because of PR risk and somebody could say the wrong thing. And they're like, we encourage everybody to and try to train people on how to go do that. And it's just, it all reflects the mindset. We're here to serve this audience. It's not about us. It's about them. You know, and it's real at Riot. And so I think it just, it, that manifests in all these subtle ways where players that have these high expectations, like, whoa, this, this game is made with love. Even though we had jank, even though we made mistakes, even though our art was terrible when we launched, like, even though we had bugs and all these things, people would, they saw us working on it. They saw people working hard to improve. And so they believed and gave us the benefit of the doubt. And, you know, that's, that's one of the things that I think has been most rewarding is when so many players who had faith and courage and then helped, you know, in so many different ways have now been rewarded for their belief. That's really cool. It's got to feel good. Yeah. Um, it sort of reminds me in a little bit, in a, in a way of like Southwest, how in kind of a weird way, um, mm -hmm. where Southwest, you might be able to say, well, Southwest only has flights to certain cities and there aren't seat assignments. Right. And so, so Delta then tries to copy those two things. Right. But it's not those two things. It's not join my team. Right. It's sure that is one of the 35 or a hundred differentiators where if you, you know, Delta will be 60% as good at those 90 things and then it's a terrible experience. Right. I completely agree with you. So, you know, and I think Southwest is cited in a Marco, Michael Porter article, you know, from Harvard, you know, around what is strategy. And I think Riot is a very similar case to them where it is this whole, you know, the sum of these different nodes of competency where the whole becomes greater than some of its parts. So our strategy in some ways we can hide in the open because it's, mm -hmm. it's nearly impossible for other companies to replicate because they're not going to have a company or currently don't, right? It's very difficult to go have thousands of people who are authentically driven to try to serve. Like, you know, I mean, it's just, we had the luxury of building what the future of the industry kind of needed from the ground up, unencumbered by the legacy of the previous business model around packaged goods. So we're, we're hard to partner with. We're really hard to partner with. When we talk to various sports companies about, hey, can you help broadcast League of Legends and run events with us? The people laughed at us, right? And understandably so you know so then just like when we tried to build we realized we had to build publishing expertise we're like okay we need to go build sports expertise how do we go build leagues hmm. how do we build broadcast capabilities what does live events look like will fans show up right will they will the, is it appropriate to run it in, in arenas are people gonna is there gonna be energy and i mean we had all these questions and so again it was sort of driven by the this player orientation and deep empathy for wouldn't it be cool if and that has guided the company through so many ambiguous, difficult situations around which path is the right path, A, B, C, D. You know, for us, we try to put our player hats on and say, well, what's the right thing for our audience? And then how do we go do that? And then, you know, necessity is the middle of it. we then build the competencies to kind of fill that in. And, you know, we've been losing lots of money over many years around esports. 
And that's starting to change, which is really cool. But we first had to go build this great experience, build the fans, build, demonstrate that lots of people wanted to watch and that we could treat brands and sponsors well. And, you know, but if you're a Fortune 500 CMO five years ago, you never heard of esports. You heard of called Game Day, right? You're down to sponsor ESPN, but why would you go do this thing called League of Legends? And, you know, again, it's been, now people are coming to us, which is very different. It's cool. It, it reminds me of, um, I forget, I think it's like a Warren Buffett thing where he says, make one decision that allows you to not have to make a thousand other decisions. Mm -hmm. And sort of like player perspective is the decision. So then you look at every other decision through that lens and it makes right. it simpler. One of the things that's hard at scale is the question around, well, who is our player? Sure. Right. And lot, and yeah, I got a lot of questions. Okay. About it. No, you cool. can, you can talk about it. Yeah. Well, and so lots of like when you, when your competencies as an organization continues to grow, lots of people at the organization naturally want to do more and that's good and appropriate. The challenge is when you're doing more, how do you make sure that it's relevant and the right things also back to that mission, back to who's that customer. And in my experience, one of the biggest challenges for an organization is alignment, keeping all the different people, systems, processes, investment opportunities, all focused on trying to really deliver value to your customer. And a lot of the, a lot of the entropy that exists in that system is it makes sense. It's driven by rational decision makers and smart people, finance coming in and saying, we need a budgeting process that is fair so we can make sure that we are spending money efficiently product leaders who have cool ideas for games. Uh, marketing folks who want to go run campaigns and, you know, drive new traffic through spending a bunch of money on performance based ads, or whatever, like none of those decisions are bad decisions in isolation, but at scale, when lots of different people are doing these things, if it's also not oriented by that, yes, but for who, and if we're trying to cater to this really high expectation gamer, are these things helping them or, or are they not trying to cultivate the organizational confidence, conviction, wherewithal to understand the nuances and subtleties around your, like what Southwest would do for that regional mm -hmm. business traveler and why Delta doing it or Continental or whatever. Like it's not the same thing. You know, it's sort of, it's oriented from a different perspective. It's not an ROI based traditional business decision. We look at revenue as a trailing indicator. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so there's, there's then all of these challenges where when people really like, and, and, and these people are, and everybody's skeptical also, because it sounds like a bunch of ballyhoo or nonsense uh, in some ways. And so it's also then really important for the organization to learn together over time. And virtually all of our biggest mistakes as a company have come from misalignment. Mm -hmm. Leaders who are capable leaders, who oftentimes have led teams or people in a direction that is different than what the organization is all about. And then it manifests in outcomes that are negative for our player, negative for the company. And again, but it's, people aren't doing that intentionally and trying to cause harm. Oftentimes it is a, a challenge of incentives and how are we designing the organization and what's the process and what are we rewarding and how do we frame goals and targets and how do we educate people? How do we cultivate empathy more? You know, so one, one of my great stories that I love from an organization called USAA, which is an insurance company that is focused on serving military families is they have a really robust onboarding process and for new employees. And so they, when new employees start, they dress them in camouflage and put on body armor and helmets and they make them eat MREs, you know, meals that are ready to eat and whatnot. And they're trying to cultivate empathy of what it was like to be a soldier. Mm. And that's really, really cool because when somebody's calling for an insurance claim, it's like, well, if you understand their context, you're so much better equipped to help them in all these intangible ways where you just, you'll care more. Right. And so we, as an organization, try to build systems to do that. We have a six day robust onboarding program called denubification, where we're removing the noob from you. And rioters is, is our term for employee. They come in and a lot of them are shocked. They're like, wow, I, I want to go work on my team and whatnot, but I'm so glad I was oriented in this cultural indoctrination with all these stories and lessons and processes and why and whatnot. Because then when I go meet my team or connect with my team to go do work, right, I, I understand the mission, the purpose, the soul of what we're trying to do more. Because and again, the journey of really learning all the ins and outs of what a great decision is for us or a bad decision takes a lot of time too. But for us, like we've had to become great at educating people and aligning teams. And there's so many different aspects of that. And again, we, we still don't bat a thousand. Uh, but anyway, that's something we've spent an awful lot of time on because it's, I, I fundamentally believe it is so important to continuing to actually deliver value for our customer and fulfilling our mission. Yeah. And that seems to be a clear thread through everything that there's a North Star. And 
there, even like the onboarding process. It's so interesting how to, how to handle that. Right. Um, we'll get back to, I have a question about the customer adoption curve because sure. if you're very focused on this specific type of customer, yet we started with the stat that you have 111 million people playing the game. Um, I have questions about that. But before we get to that, let's close the loop on um, what I'll call early stage where you run, uh, you sort of release the game. Yep. We talked about how you grow. We talked about all of that. Um, so I want to get to some general questions about early stage. For founders that either need or think that they need upfront capital before building a product, yep. do you have any advice for that? Yes. So one, validate that is really true because I think capital can be helpful at a lot of things, but it also it does come with strings attached and expectations. And it'll change the nature and dynamic of what the company is doing uh, and put a different type of pressure on the entrepreneur than than existed previously. But again, can also be great in certain situations. So uh, I think different businesses will need to validate that in different ways. In our case, without technical expertise, like in a brand, I didn't take a salary for the first you know, year plus of the company and whatnot, but and we would have been happy to pour our heart and soul into building this thing if we could, but we couldn't. And so we needed to hire people. So we needed the capital to go do that. And we didn't have any money. So we needed other people's money. And so then we needed to go convince them to bet on us. And that's a very difficult thing, especially as first-time entrepreneurs, 24, 25, no, you know, very little credibility. So we recognized we had this massive credibility gap. So then we thought, how do we overcome that? And uh, one of the ways to do that was ensure that people could understand our story. And so we built a pitch deck. 15 slides, I think more than that, oftentimes it can start to become too cumbersome. And we had a really difficult story to tell because we're talking about things that often hadn't happened yet and why this was the future. So um, the first thing we need to do is have people understand what we're trying to do. And so that was what the deck was, 15 slides. But then we had 200 slides of backup and sort of an appendix. So when, some, when the inevitable investor or skeptic would say, yeah, but what about X? And we'd be like, oh, that's a great question. If you refer to slide 164, we can see, <laughs> and it'd be like, yeah, but what about, what about Y? And they'd be like, yes, another great question. On slide 88, we can see, <laughs> you know, and so they were like, oh, they've all of these reasons as to why this shouldn't work. They have identified these things. They've come up with thoughtful responses and made arguments as to why it will. And that helped improve people's confidence. Okay, at least these people are being thorough and thoughtful and they're going to be somewhat responsible with decision-making and resource allocation. Um, that was really, really important because obviously execution was identified appropriately from investors as one of our biggest risks, hence the tranched financing. So, uh, you know, I think, and then getting the right shareholders is also incredibly important. So one of the things that's been really thematic for Riot, you know, around alignment, not only with all of our employees to try to deliver on a mission is also shareholders. It's why we didn't go public. You know, we think it's incredibly important to be focused on long-term value creation for our players and if investors don't believe that, right, or are driven by other shorter term incentives, that will then create lots of different pressure on the CEO, on the organization to do things in a misaligned way. And so we were very fortunate that our early investors, of course, they seized, right, everybody was equity aligned. So the, generally speaking, the, uh, you know, delivering great value for players would create value for our shareholders. Our, in, our early investors, uh, decided in 2011 uh, to you know, pursue or explore market opportunities, right? Meaning sell, sell the company. And then we went through this whole process of doing a roadshow with various other media companies and whatnot. And what was fascinating was Tencent, who had licensed the rights to League of Legends for China. We hadn't operated, we hadn't launched in China yet. Uh, they had invested alongside our VCs in our second institutional round. They had a board observer seat. They're like, are you guys crazy? Why do you want to sell this company? You're just getting started. You haven't launched in Korea. You haven't launched in China. You're doing all these things. Like, metrics are continuing to grow. And in all of our conversations with various other companies, again, people didn't still really didn't appreciate or understand what we were doing. And so everybody just purely valued us 100% based on financial metrics, which still, again, which were healthy and good and you know uh, generated the outcome. But it was a situation where we really believed that the company was just getting started, but we didn't have control. And so it was appropriate for us to play our role you know, in supporting a, a, a transaction for our investors. And it was a great transaction. Everybody did really well. But it was also very important for us to get the right long-term mm -hmm. home for the company because we believed Ubersal was getting started. And so Tencent, interestingly enough, as a Chinese company, they understood or appreciated and valued the, the player-centric mission we had. And, and were, they essentially came in to buy the company, but structured it much more like a private equity deal where they're like, we don't want to tell you guys what, how to run this. We believe in your vision. We want to support you and support your employees and everybody. And we'll give more equity to every employee post-transaction they had even pre, but go continue to create value, go do your thing. 
And that was shocking to us. And in some ways we didn't even fully believe it. And we're sort of always skeptical and waiting for the carpet to be pulled out from us, you know, things like that. But over time, we've really come to appreciate the wisdom and sort of the long-term perspective and relationship. And that's ended up, I think, helping the company be able to grow and evolve the way we have because of that shareholder alignment. So I think it's really, really important for entrepreneurs that are looking to raise money to assume you're going to, Hmm. if you like, and think about what's the criteria, like who would make the ideal investor? What, and what are you looking for? And then really go try to get those people. And that's not to say that you shouldn't go meet with lots of VCs. I think you should, right? Or, Or family offices or potential investors or private equity firms, depending on the stage of the company. But understand their incentives and what's driving them and how, wh- how and where you're aligned and where you aren't. And are, just like with a business partner, I think it's a really important conversation around because um, these things are marriages. These are long term relationships. So it's not about having disagreements or not having disagreements. You're going to have them, but it's when they happen, how do you problem solve them and in what direction or vector? And the more it can be aligned with the sort of the company's mission, purpose, et cetera, I think the, the higher the likelihood of success. Mm, really interesting. I guess two more questions on the early stage stuff. And I think that is like really valuable to think through. So many of our founders, again, are just like, I will take money from anybody. Right. And that flipping that mindset of your, you again, have opportunity cost. Well, and, and, and if you're creating something of value, right, there's a lot of capital in this world and there's a shortage of good deals from an investor perspective. If you believe in what you're doing, find a way to demonstrate that that's the case. And if you can, there's going to be capital for it. So then if you assume that that's true, it's like, well, what, who, what's the right capital? Mm-hmm. That's kind of a nice little test for entrepreneurs too, to say like, can I build a 15 slide deck with 200 page or 200 slide appendix for every potential question and have a good answer to it? Right. And maybe, you, maybe, you know, it's, you're not going to be right about that, but at least thinking through it all. Mm-hmm. Um, cool. So I'm an essentialist. Um, I really believe that most things don't necessarily matter and a few things do. Yeah. Um, what mattered? Like, what did you get right? for the early stage stuff. Yeah, I, I, so I think I agree with you around, there's a lot of things that companies do that are sort of incremental at best, sometimes negative in value creation, and there's some things that are really, really important. I think in our case, getting the business model right was super important. And that is sort of derived from the strategy and sort of recognizing as this newcomer to this very established industry, we needed something that was gonna be very, very, very disruptive to get people to even give us a shot. And to us, that was having a really high quality, but a game that was also free. And then a, you know, the ability to update the game frequently and try to deliver tremendous value. So, so many, most players in League of Legends will never spend any money. And that's totally fine. Mm-hmm. And we actually just told Forbes, I believe, you know, that now League of Legends as a franchise has grossed over 20, or is about to gross, or hit the milestone of $20 billion in gross Ooh. revenue. And, it, you know, it's, so the, the, the concept of delivering incredible value, people want to spend money on things that they think are worth their time. And then we just needed to find ways to do that. And so that was really, really important. I think the other thing that was absolutely critical for us is is people. Getting the people right and getting the team right and really establishing a team dynamic is super important because we had all these competent experts now, like even once we had the right people, they all have very different perspectives about what's important. And so then aligning everybody around it's like, hey, Art, I know you want better tools, and I know you want to go invest in X. And hey, design, I know you think that X, Y, and Z is flawed and whatnot. And hey, engineering, I know that by, the pipeline's broken and there's a lot of tech debt and whatever. However, you know, in, in, you can insert any particular competency or discipline, and everybody has their list of complaints or things that they think are really important. Then going like, yep, let's hear all those things. Let's acknowledge all those. Let's have everybody else see those. And then let's go, let's look at, well, what are we actually doing currently? How are all, what are our priorities? How are the resources allocated? And do we think that we should all be changing these resources? Yes or no? And if so, okay, well, let's have that discussion with the trade-offs are. And if not, well, then don't leave this meeting and go complain to any other employer or to the people and be like, I can't believe we're not getting X. Because humans naturally do that. And so to us, it was really, really important to aligning all of these incredibly smart, talented individuals around what really mattered. And the, what, the only way in our experience to do that is involving people in the process and having the discussion over and over and over and over. And then replicating that as you scale across all the different teams. Mm-hmm. So we, we run a, a relatively complex sort of three-dimensional matrix. I'm not going to try to describe it um, you know, in too much detail, but suffice it to say, it's an inf- we think it's an infinitely scalable recursive model that tries to create the context for everybody to be aligned. And so you can sort of imagine it 
as ships in a harbor. So and at one point, we're on one boat. And, you know, we've got the, you've got a captain, you've got the oarsman, you've got the navigator, you've got, you know, all the different competencies necessary to run a ship, you know, the gunners, you know, whatever you need, or cannoneers. And then over time, you need to add more people to the ship. And then all of a sudden, you have two ships. And then fast forward to as a company scales, now you have 50 ships. Well, sometimes you can have bigger ships or smaller ships, right, which are different teams that have different missions. Sometimes the teams that have different companies or different ships should work together and have their own little art, you know, group. And then other times it's a massive armada. And but all of those things that also are making their own decisions need to have the agency where the individual captains feel like this is my team hmm. and I want this gunner on my team. And as that gunner on that ship, you're like, I am excellent at my job. And we, you know, so we're trying to create the conditions across the entire company where each team feels like that, each individual feels like that, where they take pride in their work, they own their decisions, but they're also remaining aligned and adaptable and agile to be able to respond to the changing needs of our audience hmm. because we organize work by audience need, not by team structure because team structures are arbitrary constructions to go deliver value. So sometimes you should create or destroy teams and sometimes you should move people around. But thinking about what is the mission? What do we need to accomplish? What do our players need? And then what are the competencies necessary to go deliver that? We think is a really, really important thing. And when we can get all the teams aligned as we have these incredible competencies now, the things we can do are world changing, which is really cool. And, and anyway, but that's, I think that's a really important thing. And it's, so it, it, but it starts with mission strategy, business model, and then it's all about people. And are we able to deliver that? Yeah. It sounds like you spent a ton of time on internal systems, internal processes, alignment, mm -hmm. really interesting. Well, and then trying to build tools to help facilitate that. Cause in the same way that, you know, when you're a startup and you're 15 people or 50 people, it's really easy for everybody to know what everyone else is doing through osmosis. You can run around the office. When you have 2,500 people and across different time zones, language barriers, different competencies, engineers think about the world different than artists do, you know, our needs in our Moscow office, which is more of a startup are very different than our needs in Seoul, you know, where we have 50% market share. So building trust and helping people learn how to have high quality interactions across all of these barriers to collaboration is also a really important competency for the organization to develop. And so we, this is why we work with Harvard a bunch to come in to be like, help us train humans on how to trust each other and how to collaborate and how to remain aligned because in the absence of information one unfortunate thing about our species is oftentimes we make up things or we fill in the gaps based on our pre-existing cognitive biases and sometimes that can negatively manifest in terms of well i don't know what's happening over there or i don't understand why they're doing xyz so f those people right and that that's not an ideal response right it's if you assume hey those people are smart and well-intentioned and maybe there's some information that they have that I don't have. And maybe I have some information that they don't have. Maybe the interaction should be one of, hey, help, let's let's bridge that gap. 99% of the time when you give people the benefit of the doubt and you sort of approach it from that perspective of curiosity and benefit of the doubt, the interactions become positive. And then people learn like, oh, I get why you're doing that. But let me help you by giving you this piece of information that, that you didn't have. And so anyway, then that goes to culture and that goes to hiring and talent and, and, uh, and goes to training management and leaders who are capable of doing that, which is, again, another really hard thing. Yeah. Wow. Amazing. Could talk about that for a whole podcast. <laughs> um, so I'll ask one final question on the early stage stuff called the Billy Madison question. And this is uh, for Billy Madison, the scene where Adam Sandler grabs a kid by the face and shakes him and tells him not ever, not to ever grow up. Right. Um, if you could grab entrepreneurs by the face, early stage people, someone with an idea who's like, I need to think about building this thing or, or should I do it or not, um, what would you tell them? You know, I, I do think to your point around essentialism, I think it's a really important question. And, you know, I think I would, I would tell an entrepreneur, find a way to develop a deep conviction in what you're doing. Because if you don't believe, how are you going to get anybody else to believe in what the potential is? The method by which you will achieve that conviction will likely vary depending on the nature of the industry. If you're doing, you know, a pharma startup, or it's like, well, have you proven in the lab that it works or have you, or is the, is the math behind it or the science behind it so sound that you know, and then you just need to, you know, find a way to create it. I mean, it, it totally varies, but I think, you know, and this goes to, you know, one of like the superpowers, how it can be channeled negatively, right? If you think about, or the danger of it, so to speak, but like Theranos as an example, you know, the charisma and the vision and the, and the belief seem to, I mean, it drive a lot of people to go believe in, in the potential. And, 
on the one hand, that is so important and so helpful. But on the other hand, you, you need to make sure that you're actually dealing with reality mm. and that you're not deluding yourself. And that's so important for the entrepreneur. Be like, are, how sure are you and how do you become sure? And if you're not sure, how, what's the right way to frame that? Because we weren't ever sure that if we built League of Legends the way it is, that it, it would be successful. And we surely didn't believe that it would ever be as successful as it is. Like that would have been, you know, crazy to assume. But we believed in the potential. We believed in that if we could do X, wouldn't it be great? And the sort of emotional impact it would have because we could deeply relate to that and empathize. And that was the data that was different than all the analyst reports or all of the analytics and whatnot. And I think it's really important for entrepreneurs to have the the sort of courage to trust the emotion and the intuition and the sort of art of it, but the discipline and the intellectual honesty and the rigor to look at the facts and look at the details and analyze things and second guess yourself and sort of beat it up with like, what, are, what if we're wrong? And how do we know if we're wrong? And what are, the, what are the skeptical ways to look at this? And then you can think about, okay, how do we overcome those things too? And I think you need both. And that's really hard. Hmm. That's a great answer. So I want to be cognizant of time. So I'm going to have two final questions. So what's really interesting is you've had the core game League of Legends for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And on the 10 year anniversary, you sort of announced a new game mm -hmm. uh, for the first time. Yeah. And uh, that is really interesting to me. So like, how did you think through, when did you decide it was time? What were um, sort of the internal processes to say, like, this is worth spending more time on? Like, the core game is growing like crazy, continues yeah. to grow. Um, there were all sort of, you, you sort of mentioned renting out arenas. Like, there are all sorts of crazy things happening for yeah. that game. And you said it's time to try something else. Mm -hmm. um, how did that happen? And how did you validate that it was worth your very precious time? Yeah. So, you know, we've joked for a long time that we hadn't earned the right to call ourselves Riot Games. We were sort of Riot Game, you know, <laughs> uh, 13 years into the company. And um, so, but we, because the orientation around this, this super high expectation enthusiast player, which we are still, uh, like the number one thing I love to do in every free time is play games, hmm. uh, which, is, which is cool. And I think that's true for many, many Rioters. We also know that games like, gamers like to play lots of games. And we like to play lots of games. And so, we see lots of opportunity and developers want to go build other great things. And so as a company, it's also really important to be able to, you know, if you worked on League of Legends for eight years, nine years, five years, et cetera, you can sometimes want more diversity in your experience. And so anyway, years ago, we started developing other games. And, uh, but one of the big challenges we had from an opportunity cost standpoint was because of this commitment to players, we felt like we'd be doing a disservice to our audience if we pulled resources in terms of these great credible experts and humans off of League to go focus on new things that were going to be years and years and years away, which is why we need to grow the organization. Because we needed to backfill on League, give new developers other things to work on, and go pursue these other opportunities because we think League was validating that there's lots of opportunities. And so we've been incubating a lot of products and teams for years that are trying to do a similar thing that League did, essentially, which is elevate a particular genre or deliver incredible value to players. And in each genre, each game, the, the formula is different, but the approach is similar, where it's there's lots of games that everybody can play. Everybody has games on their iPhone or on their Steam library or Xbox account or PC. Yeah, but what games do you really play? Right? And to really get you to, have to play something over and over again because it's so cool and so compelling, what does that take? Like, that's a high bar. And so we one of the frameworks that we utilize to think about what opportunities to go invest in, it's we're analyzing and trying to validate our assumptions around where we think the opportunity is over time through prototyping and you know actual gameplay testing, things like that. And also from a strategy standpoint, as the world continues to change and as other companies do things, we're trying to think about what is table stakes, meaning like what do we need to get right just to be able to, you know, if we don't do this thing, we will fail, but that's not good enough. It's then also, how are we gonna win? Like what are the elements that are highly differentiated that'll elevate the experience in a great way? We need both in everything that we're doing. And then we try to go build the teams and again, take the long-term perspective to go cultivate this great expertise, this great passion that can actually elevate these genres. So announcing these games has been this really exciting moment for the company because rioters have kind of known more or less that we've had all these games and are excited about the future and all that, but getting impatient in a lot of ways. And the, and the rest of the world oftentimes is like, hey, you're the, you're the kid who got lazy and, and was only focused on one thing and maybe you're always going to do that. And the focus was deliberate, but it was never... It was never enough because the mission is never complete. It's this aspirational 
goal where we can always do a better job of delivering value for our players. And so, anyway, it's really exciting to showcase these six new games we've announced in the animated series. And the player reception has been initially like incredibly positive, which is really validating for rioters uh, and really exciting. But and now, you know, we get to go deliver what everybody's been working on for a long period of time. And that's what the company's good at. And so that's, that's a, it's a really exciting moment for us. Very cool. Congrats. Thank you. It's awesome. One more question I would ask on that is for these 10 projects games series, how many did it start at 100 and get whittled down to 10? Mm -hmm. What did that process look like? So there's a variety of different ways that we will create new projects or sort of, you know, go through the green light process. So anybody at the company can submit a game idea, just mm -hmm. like anybody at the company when we were first building League could create a character essentially or submit a champion idea, whether it's a piece of art or whether it's a, a, a gameplay, some gameplay mechanics or a, a bio about, hey, wouldn't it be cool if this character existed? We think about the same thing where nobody has a monopoly on great ideas, but ideas, they're necessary but insufficient. Execution really is what matters. And so we try to source lots of ideas and try to source sort of entrepreneurs who then also have the capability of thinking through all of the, these different dimensions about why, and, and create a thesis about why there's a particular underserved player that, that needs to have a game like the game that they're postulating. And then it's, okay, cool, can you go build the team? Can you go attract other developers that are necessary to go do this? Can you then make progress to then validate? We think about it pretty similarly, I think, to how maybe some VCs think about funding a portfolio of different companies and what they look for in entrepreneurs. It's just the good thing is, like, as a game developer, we'll enable you to focus on building the incredible thing that you're excited about without having to build the publishing infrastructure and all these other things, you know, building all the financial back end, all this stuff that detracts from the essence of what you're really trying to do. Like, I wish that existed when Brandon and I were trying to go build a game. Like, if I were to ever go build another game developer, I'd want Riot to publish my game because, you know, for lots of reasons. But, and then over time, we're trying to validate through Gates, are we making enough progress? Are, is the thesis still true? Is it still the right one? Uh, because the world is dynamic. And there's been times when we've, you know, canceled projects. Uh, internally, there's been times when we've pivoted or rebooted teams or leadership. Uh, and so we're always evaluating, is it the idea that's the problem? Or is it the execution that's the problem? And then if it's the execution, is it because of the people? Or is it because of something else? Like, or is it just, it can't be done? Like, what, what's going on? And we're also trying to always validate quality of decision making. So it's not about don't make mistakes. Mistakes are part of the deal, like for companies, for people, for teams. It, learning is really important. And the thought process and how deliberate the team is in decision making. And so we're really trying to evaluate a trend of progress over time towards learning the, quote, right things. You know, there's no secret sauce for that. And there's a variety of people that are involved in that too. So we've created sort of two different councils. One is like an R&D advisory council of individuals that have different backgrounds and sets of expertise that all provide perspective on the progress teams are making. And then another is sort of a creative council, which also, because we do a lot, of, a lot of other things other than just game development around, is this cool? Is the IP being treated in the right way? You know, because we do music videos and like we do a lot of stuff. And so uh, it's really important to have to get both right. And the complexity is really high. And there's a subjective factor, too, because then it's also relative to the audience. And so we're always trying to orient people into that audience perspective. And that's one of the biggest challenges is helping people learn that it's OK if you are not like not everybody needs to be the person who is so deeply embedded with that player that they can make. 100% optimal decisions all the time. Like that's impossible because we're doing lots of things. But in the same way that people say like, I like to play golf or I'm a golfer or I like a surf or I'm a surfer, right? The people we're catering to in each of these genres are the people who have that identity opt-in component. Like 70% of our audience, they don't say I play League of Legends, they say I am a League of Legends player. Similarly, you know, we just announced Project A, like that game is targeted to very high expectations, tactical shooter players who are really cynical and who have incredibly nuanced expectations. And you don't even start to really appreciate the problems that that audience wants to solve and unless you've played thousands of hours of FPSs where it's like, yeah, I need a server with high tick rates, you know, or please solve peaker's advantage or all these things which oftentimes people don't even know what it is. And that's okay if you don't, but you need people on your team that do and you need to be able to trust as like, if you're the engineer or the artist, you know what, I believe in this 26-year-old or whatever, who can, can convince me why these things are so important for us to go spend tens of millions of dollars solving. Mm. Like, that's a really hard thing. And yeah. so your idea needs to survive the crucible of socialization. And then, and, and those individuals need to be able to survive the psychological challenges of dealing with that resistance. It's a very similar thing to all entrepreneurs face. And I think that that's really, really important. But then also, again, 
being open enough to evolve and leverage people's experience. And so, and, and this is where, you know, my business partner and I stepped down from our co-CEO roles about uh, almost two years ago now, elevated an internal leadership team. And part of that was to be able to make this sustainable because it also is exhausting. And, you know, we have, it's a labor of love. We love what we're doing. You know, we still feel like the company's just getting started, but, you know, it's like, we all are focused more on trying to get to the right outcome than being right, you know, and, or being the leader or the guy or whatever. And like, and I think that's what, where, where magic can happen, where when people are willing to suspend their egos or their personal, you know, short-term goals or whatnot in service of a broader opportunity, that's when you can really do incredible things. And I think it's really important for companies that are going to create really disruptive change to get into a situation where people are willing to do that. Cool. Very, very cool. Yeah. I think that's, um, you, you've talked, you've sort of touched on this a lot too, like figuring out how to, what's the best way to get to transparency around like what it is you're actually doing mm -hmm. and like who cares and what will it take to do it and all right. that. And why does that matter? Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Um, last question for you that we sure. ask every one of our guests, um, called the taco truck question. So if I said you have to start a taco truck tomorrow, mm -hmm. how would you approach that? So first I would question, do I really need to start a taco <laughs> truck? Or it's like, what's the problem trying to solve? Because starting a taco truck is a solution. It's not a problem. And so, you know, I really believe in a problem well stated is a problem half solved. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I would do is say, what, like, what are we trying to do? Are we trying to like deliver food to people at different locations? Or are we, uh, is it because we think that tacos are the most excellent or important form of cuisine or like, what are we doing? And then I would figure out based on what that need is, is this the right solution? How do we go optimize? what would be the secret sauce of the taco truck? How do we get people to be aware of it? Is it our recipe? Is it that we can be everywhere at the same time? Is it that it's lower cost? Is like, what's our differentiating value proposition to this problem set? Uh, and then I would go build it. Cool. So I, I love that. Like first, the transparency thing, like, well, I don't, I don't want to buy, build a taco truck. I want to solve a problem. Right. And what is the problem that, and I've given you a solution and right. turned around on me. I like that. <laughs> Um, awesome. So thank you so much. This was incredibly helpful to founders, to me. I loved it. Awesome. Thank um, you. Yeah, so. absolutely. Any, anything you want to leave people with? Should they go, uh, play the new games? Like any, anything, any parting thoughts? You know, well, one thing is, uh, yeah, I definitely wouldn't even say, Hey, go play the new games. Cause, uh, you know, only play them if you're really into games. Sure. Uh, but if you are, then I think that, uh, you know, you'll, you'll probably enjoy the types of things that, that riot would offer, but I would say best of luck. And, and just and believe in yourself and um, you know I could go on and on about how challenging my journey you know my partner's journey has been personally and so you know I think it's just cool that people are finding community and other entrepreneurs and sharing expertise and perspective and stories um, it is hard there is a grind there's going to be cost on personal life and family and challenges and all sorts of things and um, but there's lots of people who are willing to help you know, some days we felt like we we're going to take over the world. And other days we felt like, oh my God, we're, how are we possibly going to get through X, Y, and Z? And so try to build a support structure for yourself, whatever that looks like, to be able to overcome the inevitable emotional ups and downs, which can be really big. I, I just, I, I couldn't state that enough. I think mental health of entrepreneurs is a really important topic. And so take care of yourself. Awesome. Um, so I know you've got a documentary coming out. Um, do you want to talk for a few seconds about that? Yeah, so there's a documentary now on Netflix called League of Legends Origins, and uh, it, you know, the the woman who did the Pixar story, uh, Leslie Iwerks, uh, captured seven years of footage of Riot and League of Legends in our community um, that I think helps contextualize some of these struggles, and again, sort of from the the rise and, and success of League of Legends. But I think there's a lot of relevant lessons and stories in there for entrepreneurs. So check it out uh, if anybody gets a chance. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Frank. Head over to GetTackleBox.com and click podcast to get some more detailed notes. And if you made it this far, please toss us a subscribe, a rating, and a review. Thanks. Have a great week.